Morning, everybody. My name's Colin White, and I'm the founder of Credit Connect Media. Um, welcome to the second edition of the online lending technology think tank series. Um, the series has been created to bring together lender and creditor professionals to discuss strategies and assess technological innovations that can play a role in producing best customer outcome. As we begin to emerge, which we from which we hope is the worst of the end of the COVID uh, pan pandemic in the UK. But time will see, I guess. So at today's event, we have four sessions planned. Um, so I'm going to share with you the outline of those sessions with you now. On our, hopefully you can see the screen in front of you. See, so we're covering off in the first one, uh, which will begin shortly. That's going to be on digital business transformation. Now you'll need to log in and log out to these sessions. Unfortunately, um, the reason we do this is that you know you're not committed to the whole day, but you, you tune into the sessions that you're interested in. So as you see. 10.45, if you haven't registered already, you need to do that um, via our uh, registration page. You've got credit risk coming up. Um, affordability in the customer journey, uh, our third session at 11.55. And then at five past one, we're going to end the day uh, with open banking and the future of lending. Actually, it says five past one. It actually begins at one. So slight error there. Um, but uh, hopefully that's the last of the errors for today. Right. So... Um, and what you'll see as well on the panel in front of you is you've got um, some various interactive elements you've got to our um, program. Um, so the platform you've got in front of you, you can obviously see this video. If you minimize it, you've got uh, information, which gives you information on this session and how to log on to the next one. You've got the important element there of ask a question. So if you click on that speech bubble, feel free to throw some questions at our panelists. Um, if we can get through them all, we will do that. If not, we'll, we'll have a, an event roundup at the end of the um, at the end of next week. I think we'll put it together where we round up the questions that we don't cover off, and we'll get our panelists to look at those. And then throughout, we're also going to run and um, there's not lots today, but some survey polls. We find it quite interesting to get your feedback on certain subjects, so we'll be doing that, and we'll round those poll uh, results up in that review, which will be on the Credit Connect site. Um, and then you've got another element which has got all the information on our speakers today, their profiles, their photos, etc. And then uh, you've also got, um, uh, like a, there's not a lot on this one, but in other sessions you'll see as well, you can download information uh, about the um, event um, kind of writers. So uh, Michael Allison has wrote a piece uh, which we've shared on there. So you can have a look on that, look at more information about Credit Connect. So you've got some downloadable information. And then finally, uh, we've got two event supporters today who are going to support us um, on some of the other sessions. So Avira, Av Avaria, sorry, and Credit Kudos. So have a look at those at some point if you want as well. Right. So one other thing, uh, the event's being recorded. So if you miss anything, uh, we will have on demand, I think, av available from tomorrow. And, and we'll also, we've uh, set up a YouTube channel. So all of our content for the last... Uh, Year plus, um, it will be available on that YouTube channel soon as well. And we're revamping the Credit Connect site soon. So accessing this information will become a lot easier than having to log in and log out um, after the event. Um, so back to today, um, there's no doubt um, it's been a pivotal year uh, for all lending teams and businesses. If we can continue to venture, I guess it's less of the unknown landscape now, but uh, a new world for lending, I guess, in a way, and, and how it's... You know, things like furlough are going to play out um, and, and the financial impacts of energy prices and things like that. So challenging times are ahead, of course, but throughout that, hopefully innovation within the industry will uh, come across and make life hopefully a little bit easier for everybody. So we hope, um, yeah, we'd hope to get your thoughts on any of that today as well, as I mentioned through the question um, part of the event um, using our tab. Um, also, one final thing, if, you can, um, if you'd like to take part in the conversation on LinkedIn and Twitter, we've been sharing posts throughout the week. Um, we've got a hashtag for this event, which is LendTechTT. So it's LendTechTT. In addition to this, we're, um, as I mentioned, um, we will run polls and questions in the review. So um, let's crack on with today's event and begin with the digital business transformation session. We've got uh, three panel speakers with us and... Um, We've got, um, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, the event chair, and it's Chris Warburton, who's the director at RO Strategy. Chris, over to you. Morning. Thanks, Colin. Um, thanks very much for, um, for letting me join the second session. It's, uh, it's fantastic. I know we've got a great, great day lined up with lots of great speakers. So a uh, little bit about my background to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Chris Warburton. I'm going to be the chair for the event. 
Um, my background, I spent about 20 years really in sort of risk operations, which is really everything across from front-end adjudication uh, through, um, you know, fraud authorizations and then through the back-end sort of like collections process as well. Um, so I'm going to be the chair for today uh, and we're going to be start talking about the latest ideas from, from a lending point of view um, in terms of technology. So, um, so if we just go to the first session, I mean, so the first session, you know, I think you know, it's really around digital business transformation. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about digital transformation uh, over the last year, really as a result of the, the pandemic as what's happened as Collins just explained. Um, you know, and initially I think, well, certainly what I heard, a lot of it was quite reactive, um, you know, so, but it now seems to be sort of moving from their active phase to moving that much more sort of proactive phase. Um, and, it, and that's what we're really gonna talk about in, in this session here, which is, you know, you know, what are we seeing on the ground today? How is digital sort of transforming business? And what do then people think about how that's going to be for the future? Um, so with me today, we've got uh, three three real experts. We've got Mike Allison, who's the head of transformational change at Roma Finance. Um, we've got Stephen Ashworth, who's the chief uh, executive officer at Perry Data, and uh, Darren Greenia, who's the chief uh, commercial officer at Lending Solutions at Arisa. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, so to, to kick off, um, I thought that the first question was probably worth asking is, you know, so, you know, has the continued development of, you know, digital and digital transformation, how's that, how's that sort of transforming lending? Um, and I, Darren, I was going to point to you first, just from, from, from your background, just in terms of that. So ha, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Morning, everyone. Um, so so for, for me, there's there's kind of a, this is a this is a huge question um, and there's a number of threads that we can potentially potentially pull. Um, but but for me, digital has done a number of things. It, it has allowed businesses uh, to have the ability to scale really, really quickly. So from a, a process perspective, you can use digital tools, software, systems, data, just to allow you to kind of interact with more customers uh, more quickly, uh, more, more frequently, and, and, and you know, as I say, really to kind of scale that 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 business um, a, a lot quicker than perhaps. You know, I'm sure there are people on the call who can remember uh, remember lending from from a long time ago, where it was a, a fax application and uh, a very sort of slow and timely. Pro um, long long process to kind of go through a go through an underwriting so so the the, the speed that it now allows you to transact uh, the ability to to make decisions more quickly and more readily um, and also that that kind of that that customer engagement piece so with the, the digital tools that are now available um, whether that be kind of self-service portals uh, initial kind of origination customer engagement portals there's there's a real ability to interact with your customers kind of more frequently um, and have a kind of a, a closer relationship with them. So, so I guess to kind of summarize for me, it's um, speed of both uh, underwriting uh, from an originations perspective, it's speed in terms of how quickly a business um, can scale and also that that kind of whole customer engagement piece. And I suppose, Mike, I was going to ask you the question. Since it's like from a, uh, for, you know, from a, you know, from a lender point of view, I mean, how do you see that in terms of meeting business objectives? And we talked a bit about speed, but you know, it's like things like is is cost important? I mean, how how do you sort of wrap that into customer strategy, costs, etc.? I mean, yeah, I think it, it, obviously, first and foremost, if the business has a goal and the business has a strategy, then we've got mm -hmm. something to work towards. Where I think business and digital transformation really helps us is. I think one thing that's really come through and, and shown through, and I think Darren touched on it, is the whole customer experience piece. Mm. You know, if we if we think about the days of the branch manager and the days of the the, the local offices going, is that digital allows you to attract and, and retain the customer through the application process, which then has couples itself with your growth and your scalability. So part and parcel of the whole um, business objective is, as long as you've got the strategy and the plan of where you want to get to, which is predominantly growth, um, for every business and scalability technology and, and digital helps us with regards to that customer experience making sure that we're meeting the customer needs at the same time it's making sure that when we're using resources such as people that you know the human touch becomes the intelligent touch across the piece um, mm -hmm. so I think it's it's essential for us uh, certainly at, at Roma Finance technology is going to play a big big part in digital transformation as to achieving our growth plan um, but we've got to couple that with, you know, our USPs as a business. We've got to couple that with our skill set as a, as a, a, of the colleagues as well. So um, 
yeah, for me, customer experience, growth and scalability is the piece that it plays. Yeah. And, and I suppose the compliance elements of this, I was going to, um, yeah, I was going to talk a bit about that. I mean, maybe Stephen, you just pick up on that. It's like, because compliance is obviously big and, you know, is, is big for all of us in, in financial services. You know, we've, we've gone from, you know, quite a human, a human based process and we had sort of compliance rules associated with that. We're now going to a slightly different kind of process. I mean, how do we sort of think about that? And what are some of the pitfalls we've got to watch out for and some of the opportunities we've maybe got? Yeah, so absolutely. I think, you know, it goes without saying that compliance in all its form, whether it's actually GDPR, CONC, treating customers fairly, consumer credit, and probably a number of things I haven't mentioned there is, is mission critical. It's not it's not a, a negotiable thing to achieve. It, it's mandatory. Mm. And I think where digital comes in um, is a great opportunity to understand and codify lots of that compliance in, in the process. Mm. I think key to achieving good existing compliance in those digital transformations and making sure compliance and legal colleagues are engaged at every step of that transformation journey so you're not ending up in a position where you've kind of done some development, it doesn't quite fit how you need to achieve that confluence of compliance in, in the mm -hmm. lending space. So I think that's kind of one area. I think there's another area, it's almost like pre-compliance or, or emerging compliance, like for example, we know right now buy now pay later is the hot product or, or the hot business everybody kind of wants to be in that space and there's lots of new offerings out there and right now we know that's getting a lot of regulator interest so i think the organizations that are going to do best in this space will be the ones that kind of obviously comply with what's there today but see what's potentially coming in the future from a compliance standpoint and always try and bake in pre-compliance or enable compliance to be implemented e easily as part of that digital mm. transformation. I think you organizations look at both of those dynamics will do really well as they move through their digital transformation journeys. Mm. Well, so how much of it, so, sorry, Chris, I was just, just going to add, add to that. Um, you know, certainly from a compliance perspective and as part of a digital transformation, actually it's an opportunity because there are tools, software systems, low management systems where actually the, the compliance element should be absolutely fundamental in terms of how that system works. So for example, when should certain communications go out to customers? Um, you can systemize all of that, remove that kind of human element of that reliance of when things need to go and make sure that that compliance process is, is, is followed, you know, right the way down to that the GDPR piece, subject access requests, you know, a good loan management system, if you get a subject access request, should be able to package all of that customer information and then be able to send it out to you. So there's there's kind of, you know, internal operational efficiencies that go with that as well. Um, so compliance and, and the, the, the digital transformation technology really ought to work sort of hand in hand. Uh, and, and yeah, absolutely, I, I, I would agree with that. I think we as suppliers have an obligation to almost provide compliance as a service and obviously, clients and receive an organization, they make sure that works holistically with the end-to-end -end service and is compliant to all the regulations that are applicable to them. But, you know, codifying compliance in systems is key through digital transformation. How much of a sense, the question I was going to ask is, how much of a sense is there around how much can you build ahead for these things? I mean, because obviously if we go back to two years ago, if we knew what we knew now, we probably would have built some of the some of some of our you know our technical our technical and processes differently. How much can we actually build ahead for some of these things using and building that into the tech now, like almost like for the, for the next thing that's going to come up? Is that easy to do, or is that something that you know is difficult to do, or is it is it, is it even possible? So I think I think it's getting much easier to do these days, where we, we mm. talk a lot about technology and api software development kit cloud it are all great enablers but really it's about the service and enabling enabling that so it is much easier today to enable microservices for organizations to adopt so rather than having to buy an entire system organizations can now buy a particular microservice whether that's data mm. you know analytics or combinations of, of, of the two rather than have to engage in a full transformation program to solve a particular new or emerging problem I think we'll see more of that as, as we go forward. So enabling, as everything moves fast, both consumer-driven, uh, economic-driven, and kind of external factors like pandemics drive those things, the ability to react and the agility there in, in the platforms, um, I think is only going to increase. Mm. So it's like the flexibility that's the enabler as much as the actual system itself to a certain extent, it's like predicting what's going to happen. It's the yeah, flexibility yeah. to be able to adapt. 
And I think the organisation that would best the obviously no one has a, a crystal ball to say exactly what is going to happen, either from a regulatory standpoint or from a consumer standpoint or from an economic standpoint. But having those thought process of what could happen and trying to think about how you might engage or enable that in the future could be a good thought exercise as you embark on digital transformation. Mm. I, I, was just, I was just gonna I was just gonna add to that. I, I think um, you know, clearly nobody could foresee uh, a pandemic, you know, who, who knew 18 months ago that the highlight of the month was going to be going to Sainsbury's for 10 minutes. So it was, you know, for, for the whole world to kind of lock down. But but the reality is that from a, certainly from a technology perspective, you know, the, the tools were there. Um, so the engagement tools for customers, uh, the engagement tools for forbearance, they already existed. Um, but I think something like COVID and the pandemic has just really acted as an accelerant um, to get people to adopt. So, you know, we genuinely believe, certainly across our customer base, that, that there will be businesses that have accelerated their kind of digital transformation by three to five years, just mm. because of necessity of, of, of what's happened. So I guess to answer your question directly, it's really, really hard to predict, but given what we've just gone through, actually a lot of the tools were already there and available. It's just, mm. it's sort of uh, act as an accelerant to, to, to get people to move forward and start to use them. Okay. Uh, and, and Michael, I was going to go back to you, to you just a minute there in terms of like, you know, how this sort of translates on the ground. So, you know, we, we you know, and I'm probably guilty of this too. We all get excited about digital transformation. And we're going to make everything, you know, fully automated, those kind of things. But at the end of the day, you've got real customers who, who aren't digital. I mean, they're human beings at the end of the day. How do we make sure we get the balance right? I mean, and what, what, how do you think you talked a bit about, you know, the, the humans adding the value, but in what's, what's your kind of approach to that to make sure it's, the balance is right and you have man intervention at the right time and when you think about process design and implementation yeah i think certainly first and foremost it's all about you know the customer and their experience should mm. if we if we're inputting digital we've got to bear in mind is that that customer will not be benchmarking us against our competitors mm. they'll be benchmarking that digital experience against every digital experience they're having on a day-to-day -day basis so they will already have a picture of what's good and what's bad I'm sure my colleagues here will have been on plenty of blue sky sessions, maybe in the lending arena where the Domino's app is used. And as an example by somebody to say, wouldn't it be great if we had something such as this? Mm. So first and foremost, it's understanding the, what the customer and, and your, your, your demographic of customer and how they currently interact with technology. Um, from that, you can start to build it through. Customers from that point of view then, how they interact with colleagues. It's looking at what are the pain points. So we have a lot of the information to hand already. So we may find that our customer experience, our um, complaint data, et cetera, tells us the points of the process, which are the pinch points, or where we're spending a lot of effort for not much reward from a colleague piece. And it's then looking to fuse that with your technologies to try and bridge it over. So for instance, one of my colleagues mentioned the reading of a credit report before in the old way of banking and an application data and the rekeying of data. That has that has moved immeasurably in the last three years in the lending space. So it's one one entry of data and the validation of the customer coming through. It's then finding out what customers do you want to interface with and why. Certainly, I'm from a, more from a specialist lending background, which means that automation doesn't follow the case all the way through. There'll be cases that pop out where you can have that either a discussion point or how you interface with that customer is key as well. I think nobody wants to actually speak anymore in certain demographics. I think it's they'd rather do messaging and omni-channel piece. So it's fine. It's making sure that you have a, a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm. I think it'd be... Um, permissive of when you when we're putting in digital change to say this is the way we are going to communicate with our customers because everybody's having different experiences and different expectations and the same goes for the colleagues as well it's making sure that we're, when they're touching the case they understand what value they're putting to it and do you think the technology is going to give like new opportunities for, for business growth and for lending as, as a result of the infrastructure you mentioned there around demographics and sort of mm -hmm. you know being quite fine around segments of you know people of the population out there i mean do, is it going to give us new opportunities do you think 100 percent, 100 percent. you know i think if you even think about the i've never been on it but i believe that there's a thing called TikTok, and you think at that, how that's developed and how people interact and I, I don't know if anyone's noticed on LinkedIn, and maybe it's just my connections, but people are starting to use um, TikTok to sell um, their services as a, as a, as a broker, as a, as a mortgage broker. So I think we will start, we will always be gleaning from it. But the thing that we can't be blind to is that the people who are heavily involved using TikTok and, and, and all that kind of, they will be lending money either now or very, very soon. Mm. So their expectation yeah. is 
that they're, they're you know they're, they're going to expect not to give us as much data they'll be thinking that we will already know or have a profile of that customer or we'll be able to extract it from somewhere so we've always got to be looking looking around at what what the current uh, population are doing because they're the next they're, you know they're the next borrowers mm. so yeah, it, it, uh, sorry absolutely no sorry I, I think absolutely i think having a good digital engagement process with the consumers in all all the demographics is going to be really important it's really important because you want to have good customer service and you want to get the, the volume into your your bank or lender but also as well it's really important because the the cost or the ability for a consumer to switch to a different app or to a different bank is really easy if i'm not getting a good service or process from uh lender a i can close the app down or website down and open up another window in in, in 10 seconds and start somewhere else whereas back in the day you'd be in a branch or you're on a telephone it's much harder to switch where you're not getting what you need so the organizations that will will do best will need those slick consumer journeys or, or business journeys to get get the volume and meet their business goals and as well and we used to see this in the risk space a long time ago in the few decades ago in in the first digital things is because a digital channel is so easy to engage with, uh, e even in, in the old days where it was kind of very rudimentary capability is, the customers that will stick with a bad process are probably the customers that present higher credit risk than you think, because a good customer has got lots of choices and a potentially less good customer might stick with a bad process because it's the only opportunity to get the credit they want. So organizations may, and it interesting what, what the audience thinks, see, adverse selection where digital processes are not as slick a, a, as they could be. Mm. Well, that's the environment we're in, isn't it? So we're in competition with, with everyone else's processes as well from, 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 from a lending point of view as well with adverse selection. You know, technology is great. Switching is so easy now that you can lose a potential customer in, in seconds by a, a bad initial engagement. Mm. Yeah, and then I think we've, we've certainly seen it with people like trying online i mean fraud's been, been increasing i know over the last um over the last couple of the last couple of uh, you know, few months at least anyway so there's 18 months i was going to say and w when we talk about data though as well just just move on to data i mean sort of we've talked about TikTok there and gathering extra data and people just assuming this data is going to be out there leading to the question around sort of machine learning or we can call it ai but i mean i mean that there's these new modeling techniques that are out there too I mean, I mean, are those things going to come through? I mean, how quickly have they started to, to filter through? Um, I did see something. There was, there was something in the um, the EU were looking at um, uh, uh, ML uh, and 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 AI, I suppose, and they're looking at that from a from a broader perspective. So I know it's out there. I know we've been looking at that over here as well in terms of like how we use that and transparent transparency and etc. But how do we sort of wrap that into our processes and our lending processes? Where do you, where where are we with it? And how do you think that's going to evolve? Yeah, so so I think I think we're we're already quite an advanced stage, and what what I think we we, we sometimes forget is machine learning has actually been used in lending for decades. I know it's kind of the it's AI and, and ML are the buzzwords of of the moment, right? But mm -hmm. machine learning in 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 its in one of its forms has been used in credit for decades. <clears throat> in credit risk models today are largely logistic regression, which is itself machine learning, and that's been the case for but before I started in in financial services. But where we're at now is that capability has evolved beyond that into AI and other algorithms, machine learning that uh, we can deploy. And we, we get now to the point that the algorithms are really advanced. The ability for organizations to adopt that technology is much lower than it used to be, uh, you know, years ago. So I, I can only see it getting to a more advanced point where there's more AI and ML deployed in, in digital transformation at different points in the process. I think the challenge then becomes, as you touched upon, is fairness and transparency how do we ensure mm. that through ai and ml it's not necessarily as easy as it is through other kind of more uh, descriptive processes like a uh, rule-based decisioning so there is an element there to consider and what we probably also need to consider as well as suppliers and organizations is what are the potential future regulatory impacts of this evolving technology because it, it is moving fast the data available is is vast there's compliance questions about what you can use that data for, you know, legitimate purposes and, and, and with consent. Uh, so I can see potential for regulation in this space that kind of mandates what we should all do. Uh, so that requires a lot of thought as organizations deploy new ML or AI techniques in their digital transformation process. 
Stephen, yeah. you, you might, so, sorry, I was just going to chip in. You might be um, sort of closer to this than me. So in my lending days, um, sort of three and a half years ago, we were looking at machine learning. And prior to that, we used to do cohort analysis and actually work out some of that stuff ourselves and see where, where we saw the risk issues. One of the challenges that we had with um, machine learning, and, and as I say, this may well have moved on, is in terms of understanding how it does what it does. So there's, there's such a myriad of factors and pieces of information. So one of the things that I struggled as, as, as kind of the, the, the head of the lending side of things was to articulate how it was coming up with um, what it was coming up with, because of course the, the internal workings of the machine learning, you know, that's the, that's their kind of IP, that's, that's, that's where their, uh, where their value lives. How, how easy is it to, to kind of articulate and see that now compared to where it was sort of three years ago? So I, I think it's still a difficult balance and we probably don't want to unpack kind of the math detail here, but it depends on the, the algorithm that you're using. So, for example, the traditional logistic regression that I mentioned earlier, that's been used for a long time, is very transparent. You can see how the score is calculated and you can see the kind of inputs and outputs and you can validate that and measure that uh, as, as everybody does. Where it gets into other more black box techniques is, is where you get a, a transparency challenge. So there's, there's two angles to that is what kind of supplier or developer of that, those analytics tell their customer without giving away too much IP that it becomes in the public domain versus what does that organization do need to do to assure themselves that whilst they might not see inside the black box, that there's uh, fairness and validity of the outputs through uh, kind of uh, you do volume testing and making sure the outputs are, are generating the right outcomes that they expect in those different groups. So it's, I don't think there's a single um panacea to, to solve this kind of dynamic between transparency fairness and protecting intellectual property either at a bank level or a supplier level so it's it's one of those where it requires a lot of thought before you adopt a, a new technique that you are getting the right balance between fairness uh, transparency and achieving the outcomes that you want and that you as an organization supplier or or, or bank can stand behind those outputs to your your colleagues and perhaps external parties if it becomes regulated in the future. I suppose there's also a bit of a, a sense around, you know, just sheer complexity, right? So if you've got like 20 variables, it's one thing. If you've got 200, if you've got 2,000, if you've got 20,000 variables, it becomes a lot harder just in terms of like being able to explain some of that. I mean, I, I, and I suppose some of that also comes down to like data and sheer number of data sources. I mean, you know, where, where do we start? I mean, you mentioned TikTok earlier. I'm gonna go back, go back to that. But I mean, like, What's the consumer perception around how much data can be used to make lending decisions versus not? You know, and will there be regulation around that or acceptance around that? And it links back to the compliance question as well. It does. I think you're sorry. I think your online profile or, or certain your, your data self. That's mm. the bit that's evolving, isn't it? Mm. You know, if you think about where you are now, if you pick up your your mobile phone and using your face, you can be into your bank account within seconds. Mm. You know, because it recognises you through through your telephone provider for who it is, and into your bank provider as well. So that's continued to evolve, and then the ability to to you know online bank uh, open banking, sorry, has opened up the wall to be able to let lenders see your how you are mm. transacting on your account. So that data self of how you manage your finances has evolved, you know, over the last couple of years. The, the, I, I do believe the my personal opinion there'll become a point in time where people will be expecting that a lender can gather that data about them you know they'll, they'll obviously have to consent to that rather than the filling in of application forms etc your data self is out there now and i think it's it's just becoming more profiled uh, to help with lending and do you think the boundary of your data self is is getting bigger and i suppose it's different for different parts of the population and is that a problem we're going to have to deal with I think it well if you think about let's take that i've just used two examples in a in a quick succession we, mm. we talked about TikTok before i'm pretty sure that the person that you are on TikTok is not the person you want to be in front of the old-fashioned bank manager mm. so, but you know the, the 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 validation of yourself and how you interact um you the, how you currently manage your bank account which is part of your data self um your your storing of your details the validation using things such as either credas or ever id that you use to validate against your passport, which also has a chip in about you. That data self, let's call it almost like your professional data self is one piece. And then you have your, um, I was going to use the word party data self, but I, I mm. think I'm a bit old for that word as well, but certainly the, the, your external, your out, outgoing data self it, as well. It's, it's, it's possible. And, and again, this is just a personal view that actually in terms of 
the boundaries of your of your data self, as as you put it, um, Chris, might be that we might actually be at the peak of um, because actually, you know, I've got fourteen year old twin daughters, and they're very cognizant already of their their internet profile. Now, when I was growing up, that wasn't that wasn't something. So, you know, we we might have been all over the place, and you know, thank goodness Facebook wasn't around when I was eighteen. But um, so, so so we're we're of a generation where uh, perhaps you know we weren't as aware of what our internet profile means whereas the generations that are coming through behind us so you might actually see that that boundary uh, actually comes in a little bit rather than just continues exponentially to go out as it has done for perhaps the last 10 or 15 years yeah that's yeah. a really good point really yeah good point. i think we, we might be at peak data self but i think uh, as michael alluded to i think what we'll definitely see is consumers being empowered to share their data with organizations through process of consent so we've seen it already as we mentioned on kind of open banking where i can give consent to an organization to access my bank and, and do do some magical things um that will probably evolve further into open finance we'll see open energy you know potentially in the future and potentially open medical records i can i give consent to someone to look at my medical records to give me insurance give me services so i think that process will will, will get bigger uh, so the ability of a consumer to control who and what data a company is accessing will will get bigger, and the things that those organisations are able to do will get more sophisticated. Hopefully, resulting in better products and better services for those end consumers. Mm. Okay, so 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 just come let's come back to um, I suppose process transformation, digital transformation. I mean, what what are what do you think are some of the, the you know here and now? What are the biggest challenges that you think we're we're kind of facing now as you sort of talk with clients or look at look at your own companies? Um, you know, I mean, what's 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 happening on the ground now, and what are the challenges you've got to get over before we can get to this sort of like, you know, uh, Starship Enterprise uh, kind of future that we, we that we that hopefully is in the near future. But um, but what, what's what's happening today? Um, so I, I think I think there's a few things that are are challenging in in, in transformation projects in general. I think mm. there's there's always been a challenge from from the earliest days that I was working in transformation of aligning business objectives across multiple business units that's quite difficult on large mm. large transformation uh, in, in most transformation programs you like for example in risk you've got um you've got a reliance on a small group of subject matter experts that normally have have a day job and kind of the other category of of, of challenge you would have is your transformation programs generally take quite a long time and they're quite thought through and, and larger in nature by by definition of being transformation there's always a, the the balance between obviously an organization can't stop doing bau change whilst they're delivering transformation alongside mm. there's always a dynamic of how to manage and how much bau change to do and incorporate that into transformation journey over you know months or, or potentially years in some of those programs so those those are the things i'm not sure you you, you get over those things and, and get to the kind of the magical end but those are the things you need to plan and manage around your your transformation journeys Mm. I think one of the other sorry, I think one of the other things that certainly we need we need to be mindful of is change fatigue in the colleagues. You know, they've been through a lot in the last two years themselves, either change of working environment, and um, probably sometimes multiple changes of working practice. You know, and then as you move then into a trans they're, they're probably looking for a steady period as well. You know, as the end user, as the person who's helping the customer through, they're probably hoping and wishing for that steady bit of, dare we say the word, normality. That they can start to at least have a, a clean run at something and then if we start then lo loading it on we say well actually we're going to change the way we do this and here's a new piece of software and here it is it's continuous change over a two and a half year period it can be exhausting for the colleagues as well so we've got to balance that out and make sure that they're on the journey with us as we go through that and that that impacts the ability to actually lead and implement real true change and transformation yeah, I, I guess I, I, I'd just add to that, you know, certainly in terms of businesses that, that, that we engage with on a regular basis, you know, there's there's the cost element, it's not inexpensive. Um, and then obviously there's the, there needs to be a strategy and, and a desire element. But I'll go back to what I said earlier, certainly in terms of what's happened over the last 18 months, it has accelerated that 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 process and that change. Certainly in terms of our customer engagements, we'll deal with anybody from a startup to a well-established business, um, but but it's been it's it's been really interesting how actually some of perhaps our smaller users 
um, I, and I'll say that in the nicest possible way, who are actually now looking at where they can add sort of uh, digital value to to their uh, their system estate at both kind of a customer engagement perspective. They just they just understand that the the, the requirement to to be able to engage with their customers more digitally is is you know it's 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 the here and now. Um, mm -hmm. And they need to they need to kind of make those changes, but but that you know let's not underestimate that that, that cost piece as well. So so I kind of get the sense of like you know is you know people were resistant to change. Let's say before the pandemic, it sort of created that platform to say, well, actually we do need to do something now, and sort of creating the almost like the impetus to actually make some change. Um, do you think that's gonna do you think that's gonna carry on? Is that is that obviously we just had what we've just had, um, and and that's definitely helping in terms of transformation. But do you think that's gonna yeah, how do we extend that into the future? How do we keep that going? Almost like that change readiness, keep that going into the future, so people don't get fatigued and they don't say, "Well, actually, we don't need to change because we heard about about flexibility and the need to change earlier as well." Yeah, so I think I think what well, I think probably thing to recognise is change probably doesn't stop. So I don't think you get to a point where mm. there's kind of no or or limited change. I think you, you get used to incorporating that change with greater agility and, and less organizational overhead and therefore less less change fatigue that we talked about earlier. And you know, a lot of that we see in the technology space and in kind of our space in open banking is mm. microservices. So rather than trying to adopt an entire system to achieve a business objective, you might adopt a microservice, whether that's data, analytics, or increasingly a combination of the two combined mm. to, to receive a microservice that addresses a great need but it's not a huge project to implement and therefore you're not seeing organizational or kind of consumer change fatigue um, because you're changing things all the time. So I think there's a, there's always going to be a cadence of change in organization and that probably won't slow down, but I think the mechanism and agility to achieve that change will become lower on those organizations that uh, have a greater level of digital adoption. Awesome. So I like the idea of almost like doing it step by step. So you sort of break it into a journey of a thousand miles into single steps and you sort of that sort of manages the change. I mean, my, Michael, what were your thoughts from a people point of view around sort of keeping people on side and keeping that momentum going, I think, as much as anything? Because I think you're right. People, some people are tired, right? Yeah, and I think it's all about as long as we're explaining the why. And, you know, I think that's that's key. And if I think um, Darren alluded to the business strategy, as long as the strategy is, is disseminated into all colleagues and we understand where we're looking to get to, you know, strategies are, are evolving uh, or they have been evolving quite regularly over the past couple of years. Uh, but as long as people understand the why and, and the um, the benefits of change, that then comes down to leadership. I think that, mm -hmm. that moves away from technology. That comes about spelling the right message, and why we're doing it. And, and certainly what's in it for the colleague as well and for the customer, but from a service provider point of view. So obviously in the specialist lending market, when you visited a broker previous, previously, they would probably ask our BDM, what's the pay away? And what, you know, what's the cheapest rate? You know, mm. with the path of least resistance. Now they actually want to know what our technology roadmap is. Mm. Now they actually want to know what our change management roadmap is because people are looking as we come into this, you know, out of the, the you know, the horrendous two years-ish that we've had, people are looking for those growth partners for, the, the delivery of these these plans, be it in mm. technology, be it in in lenders, be it in um, in third parties, so it's becoming it's becoming more of a conversation about where your business is going technology wise and change wise than it is just about the price and what it can offer to the customer there and then. And I think that that probably is endemic of that would be the consumer expectation as well that they can grow with a company, they don't outgrow a company technology based. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a great question that's just come in around. So we talked a lot about digital, I suppose, from a, mm. you know, and digital transformation in the, in the lending journey. There's there, I mean, obviously, digital opens up to fraud as well. Um, you know, and fraud. There have been some frightening statistics around, um, you know, lending, uh, lending fraud. I suppose over the last over the last year or so. I mean, what's what's the best the best way of combating fraud using digital transformation? I mean, what what are the thoughts on thoughts on that from the panel? Yeah. So I mean, as you say, fraud. Fraud is getting quite quite big in, in in financial services, without a doubt. I think there's a, there's a few things you can consider in a digital transformation might help with that. So, data sources that you can gather, both externally and behaviorally, on on customers, uh, can help combat behavioral fraud. So you see, you know, uh, that there's technology today that you can kind of uh, bio profile customers using your app. So you can so the app could or the system can tell 
where it's not they, they might have the valid logon details but it's not the actual consumer because their behavior is different so it's kind of been a third party takeover uh so i think in, in general there's no kind of uh, one size fits all in this it's understanding the process that you're digitizing understanding and thinking with your fraud colleagues and organizational colleagues what are the use cases and mo's of fraud that you like to see through that and using data analytics and decision management as part of that process so you're trying to disrupt as much as that fraud attack as possible without um because this is a difficult balance you you can stop all fraud by stop lending but that's mm. th that's obviously not a good business model so it's always that balance between catching real fraudsters and preventing fraud and not disrupting genuine customers whether that's through an originations process or through a, a transaction process where they're using a card or an account so i think more data better analytics and better decision management at different points in that fraud MO cycle will, will, is the best way to combat both existing fraud MOs and fraud MOs that will undoubtedly emerge as we, as we move forward. Fraud never stops. Fraud's a, a 24 by 7 business for the people that do it. And they don't go home at 5 o'clock. They work all night uh, through the, through the, to, to defraud consumers and, and organizations. That's just how it works. So. And I suppose coming back to the investment cycle around digital investment, I mean, if you if you if you're not keeping up to speed, you get into your adverse selection kind of uh, kind of comment as well, which is fraudsters will find the 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 area where you haven't invested necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. We we've seen this, uh, you know, all, all the time before. Kind of digital transformation or digital was was a big thing in kind of traditional card processing and card issuing world is fraud migrates to the weakest point. Uh, so they information share like like banks and and suppliers do. Uh, so if, if a particular organization has perceived to have a, a, a point of weakness, that will undoubtedly drive volume into that point of weakness and further exploitation. So it's the goal with fraud management is to kind of be near the top. So you're, you're not getting hit with those kind of uh, volume attacks because you've got a perceived weakness in, in your process or in your um, kind of data or analytics. So, so, I think, uh, so sorry, I, I was just going to just very quickly add. I, I think sometimes there is there is a slight fear that if you're using a slightly more manual process and therefore there is a little bit more time taken over a process, then your fraud risk is less than if you're on a kind of a digital platform journey. But actually, what what you that that move from a slightly more uh, manual labor intensive process to a digital systemized process should be seen as fraud prevention enhancement rather than fraud uh, weakness because for for all of the reasons that, that Stephen said the additional data sets that you can have you can bring in the systemized checks and balances you can do so i think sometimes it's perceived that actually from going for, 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 from a, a very kind of robust um, slightly slower process to a uh, a more automated digital process you, you you're weakening your for prevention when actually you know if done correctly it should be viewed as strengthening it so uh, i want so sort of, sort of related to that in terms of, i suppose you know being at the top of the tree i'm going to come back to your your question um, your comment michael just about i suppose investment in digital i mean is it is it going to be increasingly the competitive advantage i think that's kind of where you were alluding to with with brokers and how much of differentiation is it is it going to is it going to be? And we're going to see that from from customers. And you know, it, it feels almost like the new arms race that's going to be out there in terms of like you've got to be invested in digital to get new market growth. I mean, how much of a driver of growth do you think it's going to be having that digital front end? I think the the, the perfect uh, cocktail of growth is um, you know it's it's increase loan book or increase uh, applications uh, without increasing your headcount. Mm. because that's where your profitability comes in so the the whole bit in the middle is scalability you know if you're 10 times if you're five times your loan book but you're five times your your, your uh, cost base of staff then mm. you know it, it, it's it's your net results the same as you are now whereas if it's looking at that piece in the middle and i think it will drive it and i think you know probably one point that i missed out as well is that if you sit and you you know a brand new piece of talent of a colleague in front of an archaic system you know if they've come from a different lender or, or different back and they find that not user friendly for them that might be a driver in talent you know talent retainment in, in the future mm -hmm. as well you know we're all if you if you i think remember the old bank systems where you press m for menu and b for balance <laughs> if you if you but at some point we've all sat down and thought god that's archaic but then things evolve these these newer colleagues again talent management especially if you have graduate programs or whatever it may be coming in and seeing an archaic system just might turn them off a little bit as well so i think it's 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 all encompassing it's probably becoming a bigger focal point certainly in, 
and, and, and um, obviously my background's more specialist lending, which has up until in some aspects of the pan, uh, up until the pandemic, still had a paper file at some lenders. Let's mm. not, you know, and we probably still had a fax machine as well, Darren, and some lenders. But you know, that's had to evolve quickly. And now I think the the opportunity is there to say growth. Everybody wants to achieve growth. We're coming out of a really tricky period we're all looking forward hopefully this is where we want to be well actually technology is the thing that's going to get us there it's not about you know trebling your workforce and getting bums on seats moving to bigger office um space you can utilize working from home so to do that technology is going to be key um you want to attract the best talent to be able to do it with the right team etc so it's probably being talked about more and more than than than, than the products we offer if yeah. I'm honest with you. So the digital piece almost like touches all of the elements um, in terms of like, you know, what, what, what is going to be sort of going forward. Um, uh, yeah, I think what we've actually done is we've, over the last two years, we've we've had to take a, a, a pause of, of the, the BAU, the day-to-day, -day, mm. which is essentially applications in, managing the customer and getting the money out. We've had to take a step back and think totally, in some businesses, you know, re-engineer the way that was even being done. Because it went from being done in an office with a hundred people to having a hundred people in, in, you know, scattered across Greater Manchester, for instance. Mm. So that is te technology there. You can't have a paper file to be able to lead that. And that then, obviously, you see the benefits of doing things differently. You then couple that into your growth strategy, and I think that's where it's coming more and more prevalent to talk about technology, not just the pioneers like your NatWest of the world, who are really great to use on. I'm a NatWest customer, by the way. I don't wear for them. But, you know, they're really easy to use on life. That's really good. You know, it's not just about the NatWest anymore. It's about, you know, it's about specialist lending. It's about every mm -hmm. time that, you, that you're touching finance. I think, uh, sorry, I was just going to, uh, there was a really interesting oh, a, a point that you made there, Michael, which I think is really, really important, was often overlooked in the digital transformation, is that internal communication piece. So actually... Uh, making sure that the business knows why you're looking to do what you're looking to do, because there's often a fear and a, a reticence for new systems that, that actually that might mean, you know, cost savings when actually what you're looking for is growth. And then what you might find through an implementation phase of a, of a, a new solution or a new digital tool is that actually the end users, the, the, the teams that are going to kind of make this work for you are not bought into it and, and you know, don't don't make it work as, as 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 best they could so that internal communication piece uh is often overlooked in terms of the digital transformation and, and, a, and, a, and a big fear with with cost savings i suppose is does that you know does that mean that you know is it going to impact my job and there's a question just came through around i mean what's what's your view around i mean is the transformation re-engineering jobs out or do you think it's sort of change changing it i mean what's the do you think there's going to be less jobs for you know say for example underwriters yeah so i think i think so technology is going to transform roles i'm not sure there'll be an underwriting is a key skill i started my career as an underwriter uh, a, a long time ago so i know it is it's a highly skilled role um, I, I'm not sure there'll be less underwriting jobs. What I do think, because there's always going to be, uh, even as advanced as technology is, there's probably always going to be a segment of the population that needs some form of manual review where an underwriter and their skills is, is going to be key uh, for those organizations. So, but I don't think there'll be less jobs for underwriters. I think underwriters will be enabled through technology to do their jobs more efficiently. So yeah. I, I know from underwriting, you normally have a target of doing so many decisions per hour. Uh, that that may increase because we'll enable underwriters to have better access to data through things like open banking. So rather than having to interrogate paper or PDF bank statements, we'll present them with a nice user portal to see all the information they need to get what they need to make that decision much quicker. So I think those jobs will become more efficient, uh, but I'm not sure it will necessarily lead to less of, of those jobs because we see lending volumes go up all the time. It's an enhancement, not a replacement. I think that's the key thing. So let your underwriters underwrite, you know, to have an underwriter scanning a credit profile, you know, a credit report. The whole point we were talking about the AI and machine learning before is mm. to present them with the ones that we need the human touch on. You know, mm. if you've got a clear credit customer who's maintained, that is one task that we don't need to fulfill for the underwriter. It's non-value add to have them look at it as an example. So there's always going to be the role for the underwriter and, and for those colleagues, but it's making sure, and back to what Darren was saying as well, it's, it's, it's about enhancing the process why are we doing it you know we, it's about growing with the team that you've got if you've got the right team and moving yeah. forward yeah. and that's, that's 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 a really good point you know rather than framing it as cost saving then you should frame it as growth saving so essentially as as michael said you don't need to 
you know you don't have to have the operational team grow in line with the the growth of uh, what you're looking to try and achieve hmm. okay so so we're, we're almost at the, at the end now and a couple of questions i did i did want to make sure that that we kind of covered it right just looking forward i suppose from economics i mean there's been quite a lot of talk around sort of economic stress over the last sort of I would say the last three or four weeks, and you know, potential um, inflation has been talked about in the, in the new year in particular. Um, I mean, how do how do we need to start to thinking about that in terms of transformation and even sort of preparing for that? Is there a role for digital in that? Um, and then last off, I just wanted to just ask you just to think a little bit about well, what do we think that the future beyond that's going to look like? You know, you know, and how do we think that it will change the like lending in the next sort of like five years? Um, yeah. So on the economics, I mean, I can go first. On the economics, I think you know, predicting what's happening in the economy is difficult for even the Bank of England. So until until recently, the Bank of England thought inflation would be kind of transitory, but mm. now they seem to think it's going to be more in baked into what we see going forward. And and what, irrespective of what happens in the economy, I think there's two broad groups of consumers that have emerged. There's the people that have done financially quite well over the last eighteen months. Those with assets, uh, those who've kept their jobs. Have been able to work from home and unimpacted and have extra disposable income through avoiding cost in commuting and going on holidays they've done quite financially well and another group that has been in industries that have been much highly impacted from the pandemic have been supported by furlough who perhaps don't have the level of assets that others have that have done financially much less well and i think what that means for lending and and, and lenders it's going to be, and it can be enabled through good digital transformation like we're doing with open banking technologies. There's going to be a much greater re, uh, requirement for lenders to understand the financial position of their customer, it, ideally in real time, because it's been changing so fast and different groups have been I impacted in, in different ways. So understand your consumer's financial position, uh, affordability, and how that's done in the transformation process and lending journeys is going to be is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, what's, what's your view? Yeah, I think obviously I agree with the sentiments. Digital will be able to play a part because what you've got to put, you know, if, if in the in the event that we found that we're having to speak to more customers mm. during that period, obviously digital is going to help us to be able to, to shoulder that burden, should we say, of, of in, increased uh, contact either via email, messenger, telephony, you know, or even outbound contact as well. But it's probably then it's all about going back to your strategy and, and being quite key on if we found a place, what customers should we be inter interacting with? Which customers can we signpost towards digital? How do we use our resource effectively? I think one thing the last 18 months has told us is that there's going to be times where something drops in that we're going to have to be really agile as businesses and, and change. And it may mean more human interaction day one and then start to learn from that human behavior to, to influence the digital. People might want to have more real-time conversations you know, on their finances in the next 12 months. So to do that, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're allowing them to have it. But digitally, can we, can we do something different in a different space? Mm. Darren, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, I'd uh, echo um, what both uh, Stephen and Mike have said. I, I think that that flexibility is going to be really important. You know, if we're going to go into a period of financial hardship for a certain demographic, then having the flexibility in terms of how you interact with them. Um, and, you know, th there are some there are some really cool digital tools out there to, to help people assess their affordability using open banking data and, um, you know, helping them to almost self-serve to, 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 to that element. But, yeah, having that having that flexibility in a hybrid strategy, um, you know, those those with regular interactions with it. As we all know, when customers go into arrears, they tend to uh, they tend to be harder to reach, shall we say. So, if you've got a yeah, flexible sort of omni-channel strategy, then then I suspect that's going to be the most successful. And if we're having this this conversation in five years' time, I mean, just maybe maybe in three words, because we're almost out of time. What do you think our businesses will, will look like from a digital transformation point of view? Well, three words is difficult, but I, I, five years <laughs> is going to go fast. Uh, I think we'll see greater focus on data analytics and services so rather than buying software data and analytics as separate verticals as traditionally we, we've kind of done i think we'll buy services and not necessarily whole services and microservices that income encapsulate those three things i think that is what we'll see most in kind of digital over the next kind of three to five years as well as uh consumers being empowered 
to share more data than they, they do today through open banking, open energy and other open data verticals that will undoubtedly come along in that time. Hmm. Darren, what's your, what's your view? Uh, I, I think there'll be there'll be more of a divergence. So so you'll have you'll have the the, the super digital high volume um, uh, lenders, but also I think there's going to be a market that that opens up with uh, more kind of niche funding, which is more of a kind of a boutique bespoke type service. So I think you know digital is only going to carry on and accelerate, and um, but I, but I do think it will carve out a, a smaller niche market as well. Yeah. And also, um, Michael, I mean, sort of like as the, uh, you know, being being in the industry and I suppose, you know, a lender, I mean, what's what if we're five years time, what would you think it's going to look like? Um, I think I think we've, we might have used the word omni channel before, mm. before, but I think for a lender to be successful, certainly in our space, we're going to need to be able to speak to the, the TikTok generation. We're going to need to be able to speak to the builders with the Nokia 3210s. We need to be able to speak to the 42 year old. Uh, who can who's really impressed with NatWest apps? You know, I think what what you need to have is you need to really understand. Unless you're going to go after one customer demographic, if you're going to continue to allow different types of demographics to apply, you need to be ready and prepared in five years' time. You may have to have different experiences for those demographics and have your staff lined up to be able to deal with that. Okay. Okay. That's great. Well, thanks. Thanks everyone so much. I think it's been a great conversation. Fascinating. Uh, really great to hear from some real, real, real industry experts. It's been, uh, it's been, been fascinating. So thank you very much. And Colin, I'll hand back to you. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Really, really good. Really interesting stuff there. I love the, the TikTok stuff as well. I'm, I'm, I'm not I get to either. grips with that. <laughs> I don't want to, who know why it's so, uh, uh, it's only to uh, engage with my children really. But anyway, that, yeah, there you go. It's really interesting stuff, really great stuff. We had a couple of questions as well. I think we only missed out one or two. Um, but as I mentioned, we will try and cover that off in the review post event. So um, yeah, we've gone slightly over, but I hope everybody doesn't mind on that. We've um, got our next session coming up at 10.30 uh, discussing uh, credit risk. So if you're, uh, sorry, 10.45, that starts. Sorry, it's 10.30 now, nearly. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to obviously round up by um, obviously thanking uh, Chris for some brilliant chairing. That was fantastic. He's going to be joining me on the next panel, uh, as I say, at 10.45. And then, um, obviously, brilliant um, insight from Michael, Darren and Stephen there. That, that was really interesting. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can carry on the conversation. Um, we, we run this series every six months or so, so we can carry that on in in the future but um yeah i'd like to uh, round up now by saying thank you to everybody who's tuned in and um yeah goodbye from me and all of the panelists thanks a lot goodbye cheers thanks, everyone. bye